Our next team is talking about New York City's waste stream. Yeah. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Ann Canavati, and I am here to present my team's analysis of how the New York City Department of Sanitation can manage the disposal of three hard to recycle products, namely packaging, paint, and pharmaceuticals. Before continuing, I'd love to thank and congratulate my team on the effort that we've put this semester and then thank our faculty advisor, Louise Rosen, for all of her guidance throughout this process. So today I'll briefly go through a background of our client and the project we undertook, um, discuss our objectives and methodology that informed the recommendations we made for each of these three product streams before wrapping up with some conclusions and overarching comparisons. So our client this semester was the Department of Sanitation, also known as DSNY, and specifically we did research for the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability. DSNY is the city agency tasked with the um, proper management of residential waste, and their mission is to um, ensure the safety and healthy um, disposal of waste in New York City. For this reason, they are a critical agency for the realization of Mayor Bill de Blasio's one NYC plan goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. Specifically, DSNY asked us to assess the applicability of a strategy called Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR, in which um, producers are responsible for the end-of-life management of their products. And so New York City already has two e-waste program or two um, EPR programs in place, one for electronic waste and one for refrigerants. And so how this works for e-waste in particular is a state level law requires that manufacturers take back and manage the disposal of electronic waste products. And then on the ground here in New York City, um, retailers as well as the Department of Sanitation um, are collection sites for e-waste. And so here on this circle, at present, typically producers are only responsible for that first quadrant, the production. And then following consumption, the burden is on the city to take care of waste management. And currently not much, not much waste goes to resources. EPR hopes to close the circle and make the producers responsible for waste management. Um, we determined that this strategy could apply variably to the three products we looked at. And so why did the Department of Sanitation ask us to look at three seemingly very disparate um, products? So first, packaging is on nearly every, everything we consume. And so it takes up a huge volume of the waste stream. Meanwhile, paint and pharmaceuticals are much smaller by volume, but have very um, significant environmental impacts and can cause environmental contamination and threats to human health. All three of these products are very costly for the city to manage and stand in the way of this zero by 30 goal for waste. And so our research consisted of stakeholder interviews with 30 experts from um, both local programs here in the US as well as international experts for various EPR programs. Through these conversations and research, we identified challenges of disposal and then also analyzed the solutions implemented by other jurisdictions. Our deliverables to our client included a literature review and policy matrix, which give an overview of this policy landscape, as well as a decision memo and slide deck that detail our recommendations for each product stream. We presented these deliverables to Kate Kitchener, the acting deputy commissioner of the Department of Sanitation on Friday, April 13th. Now getting into some of the product specific findings, I'll begin with packaging, which had the goal of identifying key elements for packaging EPR legislation in New York City. So at present, packaging EPR exists at a national level as well as um, provincial level in Canada. And so looking at 13 different case studies, we identified British Columbia, Belgium, and Japan as being um, jurisdictions with the highest recycling rates of greater than 78%. We also identified Italy as being a key player because their EPR programs incorporate elements that would um, translate nicely to New York City. Um, additionally, in our research, we identified these following items are typically defined as packaging for um, in EPR legislation. So as you see, this ranges from aluminum foil to the cardboard, and thus there's a wide spectrum of items that need to be considered and managed. 
Additionally, I would like to draw your attention to that orange bar that shows currently in New York City, the recycling rate is less than 60%. And we're confident that EPR would boost this up as it has in all of the case studies. So specifically, we recommend that if DSNY seeks to pass um, EPR legislation for packaging, they use a per ton fee calculation, define the producer as either the manufacturer or the first importer of packaging into New York City, and have um, full producer financial responsibility, meaning that the producer will pay 100% of the cost of disposal. To implement packaging EPR, significant industry input is necessary to first pass the bill and then craft the, leg uh, craft the regulations that would um, be used to then implement this type of program. Our next product stream, Paint, had the goal of identifying opportunities for residential latex paint EPR in New York City. At present, the Department of Sanitation has several collection events and in 2017, they collected almost 750,000 pounds of paint. And so this cost the city nearly $1 million to manage, and that's a pretty hefty price tag for a product that only takes up 0.1% of the waste stream. Paint EPR does have state level precedent in eight US states, as well as the District of Columbia. And so um, based on our background research of those jurisdictions, we came up with two alternative recommendations. First, if the city seeks to go through and um, pass paint EPR legislation, they should utilize a paint stewardship organization which would take care of all the management of this program. This includes working with paint retailers, working with consumers, and the government to ensure the proper collection, um, management, and dispos disposal of paint. Alternatively, if the city does not want to do the EPR route, they can transition from current paint disposal to paint recycling. To implement these options, for paint EPR, it's critical that the city finds an elected official to champion the passage of this legislation. Once passed, then all program details and administration would happen through the paint stewardship organization, and DSNI would just play an oversight role. Alternatively, to switch to paint recycling, um, first the city would need to determine cost effectiveness. If this is found to be a cost effective option, the city would simply need to issue a request for a proposal um, to paint recycling companies rather than a disposal company which it utilizes presently. And so our final product stream is pharmaceuticals. Um, and we had the goal of identifying options for the redispension of prescription drugs in New York City. This deviates slightly from the EPR theme because redispension is um, separate from extended producer responsibility because it occurs on a donation-based system. And so how this looks is in 20 US states, there are currently operational redispension programs that take um, unused, unexpired pharmaceuticals from um, approved commercial entities and allow the redispension of these drugs to uninsured or underinsured patients. New York is uniquely equipped to implement a similar program because in 2016, the state passed a law that allows for the redispension of un unused, unexpired prescription drugs from commercial donors and um, they can be redispensed. Specifically, this law allows for a third party intermediary. So much, as, much like the case with paint, this third party intermediary would be responsible for doing all program management and implementation. Based on this research, we recommend that what the city can do is really help to push the state to pass regulations that include these following characteristics. And while this has to happen at the state level, we have heard that the city could really impact moving this forward. Um, if regulations are established, the city's role in implementation would be simply to work with the approved intermediary to get donors on board, um, ensure there's a nonprofit pharmacy in the city to redispense these drugs, and then recruit clinics as well. And so now that you've heard a bit about our findings for each of these three products, I'd like to recap um, just by outlining the policy landscape. So for packaging, we saw there are no law in place, no regulations, and there's no US precedent. Paint, on the other hand, does have other state level programs here in the United States, but again, we need the laws and regulations to make anything operational here in New York. 
Finally, for pharmaceuticals, there is that state law in place, but no regulations to make the law operational. And there is great precedent here. Now wrapping up with some high level comparisons, um, I direct your attention over to the left for partnerships. I'd like to highlight that they're critical for all three of these programs to become operational. Then um, in terms of cost and feasibility, we rated these on a spectrum from low to high, whereas pharmaceuticals clearly has the lowest cost since the city would not be involved, whereas packaging would likely um, result in very high costs for the city. In terms of feasibility, for all of the reasons stated before, we think it's pretty unlikely that packaging EPR programs would be implemented anytime soon due to the lack of US precedent and um, uh, other industry pushback. Um, on the other hand, pharmaceuticals could very likely be implemented in the state, um, barring the uh, writing of those regulations. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Anne. I wanted to know what barriers to adoption you see with, let's say, like paint sellers or um, actually having your recommendations adopted by the people, not just the government. Sure. Um, I might pass this question over to Anna, our paint expert, um, who did several um, interviews with the paint retailers. We need a microphone. Um, sure. So thanks, Julie, for that question. There are a number of barriers that exist uh, if this were to be implemented at the city level, uh, particularly in New York City. Um, there's a really limited space, as, as you all know, just literally anywhere in New York City. So paint retailers uh, would probably um, be uncomfortable signing on initially to this program without a lot of education because they would not um, want to give up any extra space to store this, even though it would get picked up a lot. Um, there's just not a lot of extra space. Um, in other places, they've seen that um, participating in the program um, brings in more foot traffic, but um, without any precedent, it, it would be unlikely for them to just be really excited about it initially. Thank you for that presentation, Anne. It was great. Um, you mentioned industry pushback, and this is sort of a similar question to the one asked, but I'm wondering about um, whether this is a partisan issue in any way. It seems like it wouldn't be, but I'm curious to hear if you encountered any any partisanship on this. Yeah, in our research, I don't, that didn't jump out as being a partisan issue. It was more just some, in the case of packaging, for example, which is the most complex, a lot of the industry associations said um, EPR for packaging, at least, is a one-size-fits-all solution. Like, you can't manage cardboard the same way you manage a plastic bottle. And all of the industry leaders have pushed back more, and it's not as much a partisan issue. Yeah, thanks, Ann. Um, I had a question about the pharmaceuticals, about the donor program. Mm -hmm. And so these hospitals are giving unexpired, unsealed, or sealed medications, which they theoretically could use. What would pr compel them to give these medications away? And instead of going through the hospitals, why not work with the original commercial distributors? Sure. Um, I'll pass this on to Anna. She, or Jana, sorry. She dove into this one much more greatly than I did. So. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I'll speak to that a bit. So, um, hospital is also defined broadly by New York. It includes nursing homes and other types of long-term care facilities. So often these medicines have been given to patients, like they'll be sitting in someone's room, but they are, haven't been opened yet. They have like a tamper evident seal on them. So if that person no longer needs the medications they pass on, um, instead of just disposing of these medications, it's perfectly reasonable for someone who really needs them, who can't afford them to be able to use them. So it's, it's not as if, um, this is medication that's just coming like right off the shelf, like, you know, fresh out of the box. It's, it has been uh, sort of used for its purpose, but remains unused for the reasons that I s said, yeah. Okay, let's thank this group. Thank you.